Good afternoon. Now, I am sure that there are many people in this room who have dreamed about having superpowers. Now, I'm talking about the superpowers that you might have seen in a superhero film or read about in a superhero comic book. Perhaps you might have wanted flight, superhuman strength, or invisibility. Now, up until recently, I would also have said that I was part of that group, that group of people who wanted to have superpowers. But instead, I want to see responsible superpowers. And to explain why, I need to take you on a superhero journey. I am a self-confessed superhero fanatic. There you go, I admit it. And I have been lucky enough that in recent years there have been so many superhero films that have been released to fuel my addiction to this genre. Some of these films have been absolutely fantastic. Some of these films have been terrible. For example, don't watch the 2015 film Fantastic Four. <laughs> now, I watch these films a lot, and I mean a lot. For instance, I have seen the 2012 film The Avengers more than 70 times. <laughs> yeah, 70 times. In fact, I watched it on the train as I traveled here to Berlin for this event. <laughs> Avengers Endgame is in the cinemas right now. I've seen that film, not 70, but eight times. And in fact, the first day it was released, I saw it at midnight, went home and slept for four hours, and then got up again at 10 o'clock the next morning <laughs> to watch it again. So I saw it twice in 13 hours. You may think this is a little excessive, but there is a method to my madness. So I am an Irish physicist. You might already have picked up I'm Irish from my accent. And since the age of 12, I've always wanted to be a scientist. I loved maths, and I still do. And I actually work in computational physics, where I write computer programs to model the world that we live in. Now, I watch these films on repeat to explore the scientific and technological perspective of these films. I'm looking for ideas. I'm looking for innovations. I'm looking for the questions that I think need to be answered. And these, these films have proven an incredibly valuable resource to me. Now, say what you will about the plot holes of some of these films or the motivations of the production companies behind them, but for me, as a superhero fan and a scientist, these films are goldmine. And I've had the opportunity of kind of living a dream. I've combined my interest in a hobby, which is superheroes, with my career as a scientist and I actually do research on superhero science. <laughs> One of the first things that I produced as part of my research on superhero science was a book. I self-published a book about three years ago. It's called Secrets of Superhero Science. And in that book, I talk about the real science that you would do at school and the current sci scientific research that's ongoing around the world that could lead to the emergence of superpowers in our world. That's your world. And I've also written a book about someone who I believe is the greatest superhero of all time, particularly in terms of the science and technology that he uses. And that is about Santa Claus. <laughs> because what Santa Claus does at Christmas is truly extraordinary. Santa Claus is truly super. Now, I don't just watch films and do all the science behind this to figure out if I could actually have superpowers. I'm striving to do more with this topic. I use it as part of scientific communication, scientific outreach, and in my teaching. Superheroes is a really powerful platform that can resonate and connect with an audience. It truly is a way to capture people's attention. Superheroes are fun. They're entertaining. They're inspiring. They are empowering. Now, anytime I'm preparing to do a talk, I do two things. First of all, I watch the films a lot. Avengers 2012, I've seen it more than 70 times. That film is two hours and 20 minutes long. That's a lot of hours. Number two, I read scientific papers in many different disciplines. Multiple disciplines which are outside my own area of research, which is physics, my primary area of research. So, what type of research have I done, and what have I found? Well, let me give you an example. This is Hawkeye. Hawkeye is the Robin Hood of the Avengers. He's the guy with the bow and arrow that we see in the films. And many people will tell you that he doesn't have a superpower, but I wholeheartedly disagree. 
In the Marvel Cinematic Universe films, we see Hawkeye using his incredible power, his eyesight to help guide his accuracy with the bow and arrow. So I analyzed Hawkeye, and I wrote a scientific paper about him. It's in the journal Advances in Physiology Education. Now, I should point out that this paper is based on roughly 15 seconds of footage from the Avengers from 2012. That's out of two hours, 20 minutes. It's not a lot of footage. In the paper, I talk about how the human eye works. I compare how the human eye works to the eyes of birds of prey, and I talk about technological solutions that could give us improved eyesight. Now, it goes without saying that the conclusion of the paper is that Hawkeye has a superpower. And when people ask me, which superpower do I think is going to be in society soonest that we've seen in the films and may not already be there, I always say Hawkeye's eyesight. Because there are companies out there that are trying to develop a bionic lens, such as Alphabet, which is Google. The idea for this lens is not to give people superpowers. It's to be used in healthcare. For, for example, you could use it to replace someone's lens if they've got cataracts, or to use it in some other disease issues. Now, many people will think that this is human enhancement, but it's not. It's not about giving people superpowers, because when you give someone this type of a lens, you're giving them something that we, and many of us, take for granted. It's not about human enhancement. It's about creating technologies for the better. And that was why the main question of my paper was, how can Hawkeye inspire new, innovative, and responsible technologies for the betterment of society? And I've even written a paper about Hawkeye for teaching in physics education. And in this paper, I include Wonder Woman, and the Invisible Woman, and talk about topics like linear motion, conservation of energy, and optics. And the last one is the big one, because I had great fun doing this, because for this, I actually built a real invisibility cloak. It's called the Rochester Cloak. And as you can see, or cannot see, <laughs> pardon the pun, it really, really does work. Don't worry, I still very much have got my fingers. Superhero science has been an exploration for me. I compare this exploration to, to running. So I'm a runner, I love it. I'm never going to win any races, I'm never going to break any world records. Anytime I go and visit a new city, I put my runners on and I run. You get to see parts of the city that you would miss out on. You get to explore a city in a way that you wouldn't do so if you were a tourist just walking or on one of the tourist buses. I get lost when I'm doing this, but I'll always find my way back. And I've even done it here in Berlin. In fact, I even visited some key icons in terms of the history of super film, superhero films in Berlin. Now, superheroes has actually facilitated my exploration of many different areas of science. I find myself reading papers about machine learning, genetic engineering, and ethics. And I think that ethics is the big one. Because I see myself as an ethical person, I do see myself as an ethical scientist, but when you're doing computer programs to simulate two grains of sand bouncing into each other, there's not a lot of ethics in that. But the moment that I ventured into superhero science, well, then ethics becomes very important because it's about creating technologies inspired by superheroes and placing them in society, placing them in your hands. We've got to make sure that we do that in the right way. In the past, I would have asked myself the question, can I have superpowers? But now I ask myself the question, should I have superpowers? Should we have superpowers? Should we create these technologies, and would they be a responsible innovation for society? They are absolutely key questions that have to be addressed when it comes to these, this kind of a topic. Now, many people will say no, and many of you in the audience might say no. But you know what? We already have superpowers in society. They're part of our everyday lives, whether we like it or not. The smartphone is instant information anytime, anywhere. You could be on a train traveling across Europe, checking the weather reports in Canada, getting football scores from Copa America, and booking tickets to your favorite band. I compare it to the Charles Xavier or Jean Grey of superpowers. Instant information anytime, anywhere. But this technology, which I use, and I, I really enjoy using it, it's a valuable resource, has had a negative effect on society. We don't talk anymore. You see people on trains glued to their phones. The world is not here. It's not one scroll away. I live in the Netherlands, and I see people cycling on bikes, looking at their phones. They're not looking where they're going. There have been accidents, and there most certainly will be more. 
And the thing about it is that when I go to a train station, I, I stand on a platform. I like to look around. I like to see the world. I want to take it in. I want to be inspired. And I see so many people like this missing out on something that's phenomenal, the world that we live in. And then there's facial recognition technologies. Now, these can be really useful. For example, people are using this technology to unlock or lock their smartphone, which is kind of a cool toy. But this technology could have huge benefits, particularly for those who have disabilities or impairments, and they can't interact with technologies in the, the usual manner. And this technology can help them to do that. And of course, facial recognition can help us identify the villains that are lurking in the shadows of society. But should we be watched all the time? Is it right to affect our freedoms and our mobility to move in what way, wherever we want to go and not have these technologies identifying us all of the time? Recently in San Francisco, they banned facial recognition technologies. There are some people who are concerned that the data that's gathered from these technologies will be used in an improper way. Now, if technologies are unregulated or managed irresponsibly, we're going to have problems. I think it's too late for the smartphone. But for facial recognition technologies, I think we still have a moment. We can still be responsible with the technology. Because it's all about being responsible and it's all about being ethical, because otherwise we're going to be supervillains. A bit extreme, you might think. But like this guy, Thanos. In Avengers Infinity War, Thanos makes a decision for the entire universe. He doesn't consult the universe in any way. He doesn't ask them if you think this is right. He walks this path, and he is adamant that he is going to do what he's going to do. The Avengers and the Guardians of the Galaxy unite to resist. But Thanos, he won't listen to anybody. He's going to carry out his plan, whether we like it or not. We should not walk Thanos-like paths. It's about making sure that we walk the right path, and we make decisions about that right path together. It's about striving for the good life, as a very, very good friend of mine says. And perhaps technologies developed in a responsible manner may actually be inspired by superheroes and form your future. And at TU Delft in the Netherlands, I've had the opportunity to instigate multidisciplinary research projects on technologies motivated by superhero films. Exoskeleton suits are shown in many of the superhero films. For example, Iron Man wears one, so does the Wasp. But exoskeleton suits are not being developed as weapons. In the real world, they're being developed for healthcare. They're being used in rehabilitation programs to help people with paralysis or someone who may have had a stroke to try and get their mobility back. I do not support the idea these technologies have been used for combative purposes. They can certainly make a huge impact on society. But it's important that the end users, the people who are intended to use this technology, should be consulted about the technology and what they want to get from it. Spider-Man swings from buildings using his spider web. But there are many people who are afraid of spiders. There are also people who are afraid of spider silk or spider web and don't want it to touch their skin. But spider silk is incredible. It is biocompatible, non-toxic, extremely tough. And as part of another project, we explored whether or not you will see spider silk skin grafts in the future, a material that could protect your body when it's at its most vulnerable. The X-Men, characters like Wolverine, Deadpool, Storm, and Jean Grey, they get their powers because their DNA is different. They have a genetic mutation. And genetic engineering has been in the spotlight in recent months. Thanks in part to, first of all, CRISPR-Cas, which is this genetic scissors that can cut DNA at precise locations. Now, it's been in the news for wrong reasons because of unethical use of the technology. But we should not be afraid of CRISPR-Cas because CRISPR-Cas could be a formidable ally as we try to battle against the diseases that we're currently struggling with. And in Spider-Man Homecoming, we see Spider-Man using a drone to fight the bad guys. Like CRISPR-Cas or genetic engineering, drone has received some negative portrayal in the media, perhaps because of recent events such as the incidents at Gatwick and at Heathrow in late 2018. But drones could be so positive for society. They can be used in humanitarian efforts. They can be used in search and rescue to transport medicines, to transport organs for transplantation. Why are we not seeing that as headline news about drones? And not only that, drones could be used to do structural surveillance on buildings, bridges, the Great Wall of China, and the shopping malls of the future. We may not be perfect, but the safest hands are still our own. That's what Steve Rogers says in Captain America Civil War. He's absolutely right. To ensure that these are the safest hands, we need to make sure that we sit together 
in groups and make decisions to walk the right path and ask questions like, should we do this? Ethicists and innovators should sit together at the start of a process and figure out what is the right way to do this. It's not about creating superpowers and dumping them into society. It's about creating technologies for the betterment of society. And you know what? If all of this is inspired by superheroes, you know I'm going to be pretty happy about it. The road to responsible superpowers is uncertain. And I started out in this journey, I thought, alone. But I've been joined by many people and researchers at TU Delft and further afield. And today, you are all part of this journey with me. You are very welcome. I promise you, it's going to be awesome. We will continue to create. We will continue to pose problems and solve them. We will continue to question our answers. But we need to change how we initiate the innovative process. In the past, people like myself and Tony Stark would have asked the question, how do I do this? It's important, though, we change the initial questions to, why am I doing this? And should we do this? This won't delay the process. It won't negate creativity. We'll give ourselves an outstanding chance of creating responsible superpowers for society from a responsible technological process. And as a result, you're going to give yourself the best chance of having responsible superpowers and being a responsible superhero. Thank you very much.